begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we're so very blessed. Uh, you've given us the word. It tells us about our roots, creation, where we came from, that uh, you are the creator. We're made in the image of God, and it also tells us how everything's going to end. This study is going to take us to the very end, Lord, when we see that Jesus wins. He's triumphant, and you reign. You reign for a thousand years, and you reign then on for all eternity. And Lord, you've told us what's going to happen between now and then. And Lord, we just pray that as we do this study, it will open our eyes to our sovereign God who's in control of everything, who's running and operating his universe according to his plan, not ours. Bless us in this study, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, i got ten reasons why you might want to study the book of Revelation. They're right there. No fill in the blanks on that. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It belongs to him. It's of him. He owns it. But it is all about him. This whole thing is about Jesus. Now, I, I know there's a lot of judge, but Jesus is the judge. We're going to find that the whole revelation is about him. Now, notice, it is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hear people always say revelations. No, it's one revelation. Revelation. So when you say the name Revelation, don't put an S on the end. It contains God's blessing for you just for reading it. So I put nearly the entire text of the Revelation in the workbook so that by the time you're done, you'll have read it and God has promised to bless you just for reading it. It doesn't say you have to understand it. All you got to do is read it. The third thing is it's written to you, the church. There are seven letters in this book. It starts out, chapters 2 and 3, has seven letters to seven churches, and they're really written to you because you're part of the church. And I'll show you that in just a short while. It reveals the wrath that we are kept from in the Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 tells us we are kept from the hour of his wrath. So this book tells us what God is sparing us from. That's a good thing. Now, how many of you here would like to have a little bit of the wrath of God? Oh, I didn't see any hands go up. No, no. Nobody wants that, okay? It's going to tell us what we are kept from. Uh, and also because it reveals what heaven, our, our eternal home, is like. Don't you often wonder what it's going to be like to be in heaven? We're going to get a little glimpse of that, just a little glimpse of that. <clears throat> because it gives us hope that Christ is coming soon. Because it will happen in one generation, possibly our generation. From the time that the tribulation begins, one generation, it'll all be over in one, one generation. It's not going to go on forever and ever and ever, uh, the, the judgment of the book, okay? Because it corroborates 500 Old Testament prophecies and illusions. <clears throat> I am not going to point out all 500 of them. All right? Uh, that's, that's another time, another study. Because it reveals the ultimate victory of Jesus Christ over evil. And because it completes the canon of Scripture. This is the last book of the Bible. And I don't believe there's going to be anything more added to it. And nothing is supposed to be taken from it. Wow, that's great. Hey, now, you know that each time we've done a study, we've been looking at the different dispensations. Dispensations are the different responsibilities God has given to man through time. It starts out with eternity past, innocence, conscience, <coughs> innocence fall, conscience flood, government call, each one of these is an age that they pass. Promise, law, law, cross. The cross finished it all. So we're, we're going to just skip those. That's for another study. Yeah, we studied We've studied them in, in, in just a brief yeah, yeah. detail. <clears throat> but we're still working with the nation Israel. And I got the church interrupting God's plan for Israel. Because that's what the church is. It's an interruption in the plan for Israel. So we're going to talk about the church rapture. After the church is raptured, we've covered this before, there's going to be a tribulation for seven years on the earth. It ends with the revelation. The rapture and the revelation are two different events. The rapture, the Lord returns in the air to take the church out of this world, and we go to the judgment seat of Christ. Well, we're at the judgment seat of Christ. Tribulation is going on on planet earth. And then at the end of the seven years, Jesus is actually going to reveal himself here on earth as King of kings, Lord of lords, and then set up a kingdom for a thousand years, at the end of which will be the final judgment and then eternal state. 
Now, I want you to say this with me. This, just a moment. Church, rapture, tribulation, revelation, kingdom, great white throne. How many of you remember doing that in the book of Daniel? All right. I, I want you to get these down. These are the crucial ones. All right. So say it with me. Church, Church rapture, rapture, tribulation, tribulation revelation, revelation, kingdom, kingdom great, great white, white throne. throne. Than the eternal state. All right. So that's what we're going to cover. Now, let me back up. The book of Revelation covers the church period, the rapture, the tribulation, the kingdom, to the great white throne judgment, and introduces us to the eternal state. This is an important book. Right? It's an important book. So let's let's kind of dive into it. <clears throat> I've read a lot of different people on the Revelation. I started when I was 16 years old. It captured my interest. I read my first commentary on the book of Revelation at 16 years old, okay? And so I read a lot of them. If you were looking at my library, I've always had more commentaries on the book of Revelation than any other book of the Bible. It's just been a fascination of mine. But it was uh, Merle Tenney, who was a pro professor at Moody Bible Institute, whose little book probably influenced me more than any other book. It's just a small little book, but it's very powerful. He suggests that the opening of this book follows our, our modern day opening to a regular book today. For example, it starts with the title. Every book today, they have a title. They have a title page. After the title, it's the, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 1. You can see that right there in the text. I put the text alongside of the, the notes there in a column. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the title and the subtitle. It's right there. He's telling us what the title of the book is, what the, what the content and the subtitle. I've written a couple of books. Uh, the one is called Hope for New Relationships, and the subtitle is A Commentary on the Book of Ruth. Okay, so that more, more descriptive title. I've written a children's story book called Santa Believes in Christmas, and there's no subtitle. That is the subtitle, Santa Believes in Christmas. <laughs> title, subtitle. Then he gives us the author. The human author is John. He's already told us the real author is Jesus Christ. He gave this vision to John, and John is the person who is writing it. So we have the title, subtitle, the author. Now, we have also in here the audience, or the recipient to whom he is writing the book. And it says here, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. And then he gives a little greeting. Grace and peace. The Greek word and the Hebrew word for hello. <laughs> Isn't that great? If you're a Greek, you'd say arene. If you're in, in Hebrew, you would say shalom. And, and he combines the two. He says, grace and peace to you. From him who is, get this, who was and is to come. Can somebody tell me who that is? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. I mean, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And from the seven spirits before his throne. Note that. When we get to the scene in heaven... We're going to be talking about that there's going to be lampstands be before the throne, and we're going to connect those two. Seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the firstborn from the dead. What do you suppose that means, firstborn from the dead? First to rise from the dead. Pardon? First to rise from the dead. First of the resurrection. Very first. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Absolutely. Firstborn from the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. What do you think that means? He's sovereign over everything. He is. He's a, every king gives account to him. He's the king of all kings. All right? To whom? Uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Wow. Is this just loaded? You know, this, talking about who he's writing to, he's saying, I'm writing to you who have had your sins forgiven. And he's made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Woo. We are a kingdom, and we are a kingdom of priests. There's one thing that really sets us apart as 
quote, Protestants, I consider myself not a Protestant, I'm not protesting anymore, uh, or, or the Reformed, from the Catholics, and, and that is, we don't have a priesthood, we are a priesthood. So you don't come to me, uh, you know, in confessional booth, and confess your sins to me, because I'm the priest. You are a priest. When you get saved, you become a priest, and you go directly to Jesus Christ, the high priest, who then takes you before the Father. All right? And so this, this is just a, a beautiful start. Now, after we have the title, the subtitle, the author and the audience, we have a motto for the book. I call this the motto. Look, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Tell me what you think that means. Just tell me. What, I mean, you're not going to go wrong in this. What do you think that means? Look, he is coming in the clouds. Anybody know what that means? Jesus. Hmm? Jesus. Jesus is coming in the clouds. Acts 1.11. Just as you've seen him go into heaven in the clouds, he's going to come back the same way, right? Okay. So he's coming back. Every eye will see him. What do you think of that? doesn't matter where we're Satellite we're TV. Huh? Satellite TV. Satellite TV, man. <laughs> I saw the coolest photograph in a missionary presentation. He, down in an area, there's, there, there's no streets, no cars. A guy is on his donkey, packed with all kinds of stuff, and he's got his cell phone out. <laughs> he's riding out in the middle of the jungle. All right? Every eye will see him. When Christ returns, you know, for, for a century, we wondered, how is this going to happen? that all the way around the globe, they'll see him in his return. And we know that today with technology, it's going to be a real easy thing, real easy thing. Even back then, it possibly could have happened, all of them, without technology, because as lightning flashes in the east to the west, so when he comes, there's going to be something huge going on that every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. Who's that? The Jews. People. Who pierced them? The Romans. The Romans. But why did the Romans pierce him? Because of the Jews. Okay, here's what happens. All mankind is divided between three groups. They're divided between the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church of God. <clears throat> I believe the Church is raptured. So the only ones who are going to be actually seeing him when this takes place, the Church is gone, is going to be Jews and Gentiles. And it says here, those who pierced him, both the Romans, the Gentiles, and the Jews, who delivered him over to be crucified. All the people of the earth will mourn. What do you think is going to happen? What, what's going on here? Why are they mourning? They got left behind. They're on the wrong side. From Zechariah, we know that they're all going to turn and fight him when he returns. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 14. Get an opportunity to read that. Zechariah and Revelation go hand in hand, but we're not going to take time to do that. I stretched this over six weeks. The first time I did the Revelation, I did it in one session. Yeah. Every time I go over the Revelation, I just keep adding more to it. And so this, this will be a little longer. But every eye will see him, and they're going to mourn, and it says, so shall it be. Amen. This book is going to take us to that point when all the nations are going to see him return, and they're going to mourn because... The next thing is judgment. We have at the bottom here, the publisher imprint. Publisher's imprint. I am the Alpha and Omega. What does that mean? Alpha and Omega. Beginning First and the last. Beginning and the end. What are they? The Greek alphabet has... Alpha is at the beginning. Omega is at the Yeah, in the, in the Hebrew thought, this is a hendiadus, um, or a mirism. Depends which language you're in. Where you take two extreme opposites to include everything in between. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They're two extreme opposites. It's a Hebrew mirrorism because they don't have a word for universe. The way you say universe is you take the two extreme opposites. But for him to say here, Alpha and Omega, he is everything. He's everything, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, Almighty. Wow. All right, so we've just covered the title page to the book of the Revelation. Is that great? Any questions? Um, when you said this was to seven churches, my first thought was 
separate sections to seven churches, but it's this same book went to all seven churches in parallel? Well, he's writing to the seven churches, and there's going to be seven letters to distinct churches okay. in it. So there are, okay. And we're going to go over those in just a few minutes. <clears throat> and those letters, though, were to be read by all the churches. And we'll see that in just a moment. It's very, very cool uh, in, in, in that. So <clears throat> when we pick up on John, first John, in Revelation 1 9, it says, I, John, and he talks about his lips. I got a few ellipses in here, so I can speed this up, okay? Was on the Isle of Patmos. Okay, he wasn't there vacationing because of what I left out was because he was there for the testimony of suffering for Jesus Christ. He is in exile on the island, probably by the Roman government. Okay, and it was like being in Alcatraz. You get the picture? An island off of what is that? Uh, San Francisco Bay there, yeah. there where you know we put all of our prisons. That's what Patmos was, a Roman place of exile. He says, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, he's incarcerated for his faith. He's the only one of the apostles who dies a natural death. He does not, like the others, they're all martyred. He's going to die a natural death. <clears throat> the year that it's written, somewhere around 95 AD, it's the last book of the Bible to be written chronologically. Okay, And so he's there for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And it is on the Lord's Day. Anybody know what that day is? Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. So he tells us it was a Sunday. And then he says, I was in the Spirit. I owe what I'm about to say to Burl Tenney once again in his commentary interpreting Revelation. This is a key expression that divides the book up. It's a literary device. To be in the Spirit, he's saying, I got... I was in the Spirit, and God gave me this following vision. There's going to be four of these expressions, and each time it's a new vision. And so in the structure of the book, this is a crucial statement. Most people miss this when they read it. But if you, you know it now, because Burl Tenney told me from his book, and I'm passing it on to you, and, and you'll find that this is a key expression, and I will keep coming back to it, <clears throat> to be in the Spirit, he is saying, I was in the Spirit, in a vision, and what I'm about to tell you is what I saw while being in the Spirit, in the vision. This book is about visions, about visions, okay? I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. <clears throat> Can anybody make that loud voice for me, please? A trumpet voice. <laughs> I, I don't know how that sounds, but that's what he's telling me that was like. He, he, all of a sudden, obviously, that voice got his attention, right? So <clears throat> it says he, 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 he had that, and he looked over his shoulder. Here we go. I was in this. So, so far, what we've dealt, I, I got the book laid out here. This is the whole book. All right? Do you have that illustration in your notes there? Mm -hmm. I included it. Okay. The very beginning, this is the prologue or the title page. Right? I got the title page. It's chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. That's the title page. Immediately, let's go to the other end. On the other end of the book, there's an epilogue. Okay? Prologue, epilogue. A beginning statement, a closing statement. That's all those mean. Log is mean word, epi, upon, after. Pro is before. A statement before and after. The before statement is the title page. The concluding statement is an epilogue, and we'll look at that in detail when we get there. In between are four expressions in the Spirit. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. We're going to find that I was in the Spirit when he's caught up into heaven. I was in the Spirit in the desert. I was in the Spirit on a high mountain. So each one of these, the Spirit of God is taking, transporting him through vision to a place to reveal him, to him something about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the very first vision that we're going to look at is found in chapters 1, verse 9 through chapter 3, 22. So first chapter to the third chapter. He's going to be on, on, on the Isle of Patmos. The next one is a vision. Oh, this, this one is... Uh, I got a name under that. He was, <coughs> pardon? Christ over the cosmos. Oh yeah, Christ over the no, one before that. Christ, Christ in the churches. Christ in the churches. Christ over the cosmos. 
that's what it introduces. Third visit, he's taken by the Spirit in the desert, chapter 17. It, Christ, <clears throat> at his coming, because it's going to talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in that passage. And then Christ in the city, he's going to see the new Jerusalem, heaven descending down from God, okay? And so we got these four major movements. Now within them, there's more structure to the book. And we're going to unveil that as it goes along. But this is the big picture of the book. And I've got it laid out there in that little graph for you, okay? <clears throat> so today I want to focus on the first vision. And we'll get to the second vision. But right now, the first vision, all right? <clears throat> I, John, was on the Isle of Apatmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I'm the Lord's name, and I was in the Spirit. <clears throat> and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches. <clears throat> okay. I want to apologize right now for my cartoon-looking figures <laughs> uh, of all the things in the book of Revelation. Hollywood could do a much better job of this than I did, okay? <clears throat> I don't even know what John looked like. I have no idea. I have no description of it. Did you draw that? <clears throat> Pardon? Did you draw that? Yeah, I drew all these pictures. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so <clears throat> I couldn't find them, so if you can't find them, you got to make them up, right? So anyway, here's John. He's on the Isle of Patmos. Isle of Patmos isn't just a little mound of dirt in the, in the Mediterranean. It's a real island, okay? <clears throat> like uh, Alcatraz, that kind of thing. So... And God tells him to write what you see and send it to the seven churches. Now, I turned around. When he heard this voice, it sounds like a trumpet, he turns around to see who it is, to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. A lampstand is just a stand that a lamp would sit upon, most likely an olive oil lamp. I should have brought one in. I got one in my office. <clears throat> and then you put oil in it, you put a little wick in it, and you light it, and it was on a stand, okay? And, and so he turns and he looks and he sees seven lampstands. And that's the first thing he sees in his vision. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, a Son of Man. So let's put him in there. Somebody looked like the Son of Man. <clears throat> now, I know that huh, those of you that were with us with Daniel when we went through, Daniel chapter 10, there was a comparison, very, very close comparison to this, that we identified as Jesus Christ. And so here he says he's like, because he's in a vision. <clears throat> John knows what Jesus looks like, right? Because he was with him over three years. He spent three years with him. So he says he's like the Son of Man. Why? Because it's a vision of him and it's not him. All right, you're getting the picture here? It's a vision of Jesus. In his resurrected glory. Right. And so he says, I saw one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down uh, to his feet. <clears throat> I try to draw it like that. A golden sash was around his chest. Okay. <clears throat> and so he sees Jesus Christ in the midst of these lampstands. And then he adds this. <clears throat> his head and his hair were white. That's why I made him real pale, right? He said his hair were white. That's in his vision. Like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Whew. I didn't know how to do that. You know, probably more like in his eyes. You know, there is. It's a vision. So that's what he's seeing. He's seeing the resurrected, glorious Christ. <clears throat> his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. Okay, look at his feet. They're glowing. I mean, it, it's like they. A, a metallurgist has put them in the furnace and he's heated them up and they're. He pulls them out and they're just glowing. They're, they're just glowing because they're still hot, almost that molten color. <clears throat> and, and his feet, and his, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. How many have been to the Niagara Falls? Oh, good, good. Then you know what the sound of rushing water sounds like, right? You don't have to be right next to it to hear it. All right? As long as you get past the buildings there that are blocking sound waves, as soon as you get around that corner, you hear that roar. And so, and it's kind of a deep roar. So his voice was like in this vision. Because apparently, the one like the Son of Man, which is, represents Jesus Christ in this vision, is speaking to him. And he's saying, he's got this rushing sound of, of, of water as a voice. And then he said, in his right hand he held seven stars. 
and out of his mouth came a double-edged sword. Wow, what do you think that means? The Word of God. Sort of. The Word of God. Okay. Right. He, he is the living Word, and when he speaks, his speech is the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, I think it's verse 11 and 12. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing us under of soul and spirit, and the discerner of our thoughts and intents of our heart. It's close there. You can jot that down, Hebrews 4. <clears throat> He's speaking the Word of God. It's powerful. And then he says his face was shining like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. So he had this radiant glow. That's why I don't mind people drawing Jesus with a halo. It's just... On his earthly life, it's a little premature. He didn't have it then, but in the vision, he's got this radiant glow. And it goes all the way back to the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 12, they that be wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. He's talking about resurrected people. And resurrected people are going to glow. In the millennium, I'll be a resurrected person. I'm going to glow. <coughs> I don't know if we glow according to the degree of the life we live, the rewards that we get. So some of us might be a dim bulb, and some of us might be a bright bulb. But I don't know. Okay, But, but we're going to glow. <clears throat> Jesus is glowing in his resurrection glory here <clears throat> in this passage. He's shining in all of his red brilliance. <clears throat> when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though a dead, as dead. And then he placed his right hand on me, and he said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I want to stop right there. Did we not just read that? Well, yep. In the previous, previous to this verse, 17, in this very chapter, he previously said, I am the living one and I was dead. Behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus has the keys. He can lock and unlock death itself, could he not? Did he raise anybody from the dead? Lazarus immediately popped in your head, right? And he has the power over Hades so that he can lock and unlock even the realm of the dead. Whoa, he's very powerful. Very powerful. He says, right. He says to John. John sees him in all this glory. And he says, right, therefore, what you have seen, that is the past. That's chapter 1. Because up to this point, he says, write down what you've seen. So it's everything prior to this. Write it down. I'm glad he did, because we've got it in our Bible, right? This vision of Jesus and all of his glory. And what is now? That's present tense. That's going to be chapters 2 and 3. <clears throat> As we move into the chapters 2 and 3, he's going to talk about the now to the seven churches. And then he says, what will take place later? chapter 4 through the rest of the book. I know that because in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, and after this, the latter things. What will take place literally after this? It's the same expression in the Greek New Testament. So he says, right. Now this is a key verse. If you were to take and say, what is the key verse to understanding the book of the Revelation? I think this is it. Because he's telling us there's three things going on. I, you're writing about the past. You're writing about the present and you're writing about the future. This book is dealing with that, okay? And so this is a key verse. You want to, want to just mark that in your Bible, key verse. Then he adds some explanation. You were probably wondering too, what in the world are the stars in his hand, right? Seven stars? <clears throat> he said, the mystery of the seven stars. The mystery is something that was hidden before but is now revealed. He said, I'm revealing to you what the seven stars are that you saw in my right hand. And of the seven golden lampstands, it's this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. That goes back to the very first part of the book where he said he's writing to the churches of Asia. Now he tells us that there's seven of them. And he's saying there's seven stars. They are the angels. Now, the question is, what does he mean by angels? Anybody can give me another name or meaning for angels? Guardians. Pardon? Guardians. There's a guardian angel. I like that. Spiritual hmm? Spiritual Messengers. Angels. Messenger. That's what I'm looking for. Messenger. In Hebrews 
It says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation? <clears throat> so there's a sense in which they're guardian angels. They're protective. And it could be that the seven stars are the angels in the sense of there's a guardian angel assigned to the churches. I mean, there's myriads of angels, so there could possibly be a guardian angel assigned to the new church. Wouldn't that be fascinating? Well, I can't say for sure. <clears throat> because the word just seem, simply means messenger, some theologians think that it's not really talking about spirit beings, but representatives of the church who are messengers. Now, <clears throat> we have denominational meetings, and they ask for us to send a messenger from the church to denominational meetings. It's a practice that goes to a lot of denominations. I have been the messenger for several churches going to meetings. Hey, Roger's been a messenger. He's gone to some of our meetings. Okay? You, and as a mes messenger, so you can go ahead and call Roger and me angels if you'd like. That's okay. <laughs> Those theologians that believe that it means human messengers usually mean, think it means the pastor or the bishop of the church. That they are in his hand. That Jesus has the pastors in his hand. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches of Asia that he's about to now reveal. Okay? As we move into the next chapter. So he's on the, on the Isle of Patmos. Any questions here? We're going to move into the next chapter. Decide what the seven um, lampstands were? They are the seven churches. Oh, they are, okay. The seven churches. The lampstands are the seven churches. <clears throat> and the stars are the angels or the messengers. Either angel or messenger, human messenger of the church, leader, okay? <clears throat> and so we're going to now go into chapter two, which begins the seven letters. Now, uh, they're called the seven letters of Asia, okay? Most of the time we think of, uh, uh, what are the epistles of the New Testament? And you probably can rattle them off, you know, starting with Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, place. You go right down through them. Most people leave out the seven that are listed here. <laughs> All right? But they are letters written by John because Jesus isn't telling him to write to these churches. And there are seven of them. He's on the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of Jesus Christ. These letters are so small, I call them postcards. All right? Any of you ever sent a postcard? Yeah. yeah. The content's real small. They give you about that much space, you know, to write your message in. And, and being a guy that doesn't like to write a lot, I would always opt for a postcard over a letter any day, right? So <clears throat> there's, there's seven postcards in, 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 in the Revelation here. He writes about Christ. He first writes about Christ's commission. Every one of these starts out with, to the angel or messenger of, and then he names the church. So every one of them starts this way. It's the commission. Christ is writing to the messenger of that church. The second part is the character. Every single one of these starts out with, second, giving some part of that previous vision of Jesus in all of his resurrected glory, from chapter 1, it'll pick up some facet of who he is. So it's saying, this is to you, the church, from Jesus, and it picks one of those features about Jesus in that, in that first uh, chapter. Next is a compliment. All of these have a compliment. No, not, not all of them. One of them, I think, is missing a compliment. Uh, apparently, Jesus couldn't find anything to compliment them. That's a sad state to be in, isn't it? He says, I know your works, or I know your deeds. I know, and he, he talks about, and he compliments them on some aspect of their Christian walk. The next one is a criticism. <laughs> he says, but I have this against you. Or say, but, and he, he interrupts the compliment with a criticism. He then follows with a counsel. He gives an imperative. This is what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to believe. You need to remember. You need... He tells them something they need to begin doing. And then he says, there's a call. He who has ears to hear, listen to what the, the Spirit says to the churches. There's a call in every one of them. There's a challenge. 
To him who overcomes, if you do what I'm telling you and you overcome whatever it is that he's criticizing, if you overcome that, then he's going to give you a reward. Isn't that amazing? He, he wants to reward us. All right. Now, <clears throat> these changed in order in just a couple of churches, but almost every one of them has this order. And a couple of them are missing either a compliment or a criticism. Now, <clears throat> when he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the... Next word is not church, but churches. Which means... Every one of these postcards were meant for all the churches. He's directing it at an individual church. But that is not just for that church. It's got an immediate application to that church. But if you're alive and well and you can still hear, and this is read, and you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ, like Bethany Church, then you are to take heed to what it says. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what he says to the churches, plural. So these are applicable to all of us. All right. Now, I want to show you where they are. Here's the Isle of Patmos. It's down in the region. Uh, this is Asia Minor, uh, Turkey today. Israel is down here. Cyprus. Greece is over here. Italy is over here. You're getting the picture. Africa would be down here. <laughs> and uh, Isle of Patmos, that's where, where John is exiled to. And he writes first letter to Ephesus. We, we hear about Ephesus quite a bit because there's a book in the Bible called Ephesians. Ephesians all right. <clears throat> the second one he's going to write to is Smyrna. And Smyrna is just north of Ephesus. It's still in Asia Minor. The next one is Thyatira. And it's kind of, uh, would it be like a northeast uh, from Smyrna. And uh, these are actually photos I've taken through the internet, off the internet. Uh, remains at each one of these locations. So we know historically where they are, okay? And, and then the next one is uh, Pergamus, also Pergamum, depending on which translation you read. Uh, but th this is the amphitheater by the Romans in Pergamus. Um, <clears throat> this is Sardis, the next letter. And then after that we have Philadelphia. Anybody ever heard that name before? Okay. I pastored a church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, for about seven, five, seven years, somewhere along there. Uh, so Philadelphia, that's the remains from back in the day. And then Laodicea is the last one that he writes to, and there's some ruins still there. So uh, this is the seven churches that he is writing to, so it's easy if he can get the, the letter off the island, okay, the book of Revelation off the island, uh, it would be easy to get it distributed uh, to those particular cities. All right, having said that, let's look at Ephesus real quickly and see that how we have our, our areas. We've got the commission. He writes to the angel of the church at Ephesus. The character. He's going to tell us something about the Lord Jesus Christ in relationship to the Ephesians. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his hand, the messengers, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So he's saying, I'm writing to you Based upon the having pastors and a congregation, I'm writing to you because the one who I saw in the vision has told me to write this to you. Here's the compliment. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. They stuck to it. Wow. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. They're very discerning. Can you tell the difference between a true gospel preacher and the frauds when you're watching them on TV? Yes. You better be able to. Yeah, I mean, you better be able to. They could. They knew who were the fake apostles and who, you know, uh, were after it for the money. They were charlatans, okay? You have preserved <coughs> and you have persevered and endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. You really hung in there. Criticism, but I hold this against you. Boy, that would be the day, right? You go to see Jesus, and Jesus said, oh man, you're doing a great job, but I hold this against you. You know that but, that's a killer word. 
you hear anytime somebody says to you a really nice compliment and then they say but but just negated everything before that watch this you have forsaken your first love it doesn't say they lost their first love King James says they left it is there a difference between a husband that lost his way going home and a guy that just left home yeah. Suppose a husband gets uh, knocked in the head and has amnesia, doesn't know how to get home. He's lost. He's just wandering around. <laughs> but how about the guy who just says, I've had it, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I think there's a difference here. You have forsaken your first love. <clears throat> Any of you who have been in a romance, you know that wonderful, warm, giddy, wonderful feeling, the euphoria, I think sociologists call it the limerence, the lights are out, it's just shining brightly. Uh, they also tell us it only lasts about two years. <laughs> two years. That's why you need to date for a while to see if that just limerence, we call it puppy love, or if it's the real thing. Somebody once told me, beware that puppy love because it leads to a dog's life. <laughs> they didn't lose their love, they left it. They left their love and their zeal. Now watch. Here's this counsel. Remember the height from which you have fallen. You were so in love and you were, you were on cloud nine in love with Jesus. He says, uh, you need to get back there. Repent which means turn around and go back and do the things you did at first. What got you in love with Jesus? You go back there. That's what I tell counsel, I counsel people when they come and they say, I just don't love him anymore. Well, that's, you got married, it's your problem. God wants you to love him. You need to go back and do what you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I'm going to take your light out. I think that's why there's a lot of churches that are dying in America. They don't preach and teach the gospel. They teach and preach pop psychology. Feel good. Tickle me. Make me feel wonderful. They don't want to hear this. Repent. Turn from your wickedness and your sin. And fall back in love with Jesus. I'm okay. I'm okay. Just leave me the way I am. But you have this in your favor. Oh, that it comes back. Whew. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I want to talk to you for a moment about who God, Jesus hates. We talk all the time about the love of Christ, right? Did you just see this? Jesus hates as well. I can remember a guy once saying, well, hate, that just means he loves less. I said, oh, wait a minute. If that's true, can we do it the other way around? God loves you, he just, you know, instead of loves less, he just hates you less. <laughs> if, if, if hate means love less, then love must mean just hates less. That doesn't make any sense. That's not very comforting. When we read in the Bible... Jacob, have I loved? And Esau, have I hated? Hated? That's powerful language, folks. If you reject Jesus Christ, you are not going to experience the love of God. You're going to feel the full brunt of his righteous judgment, his fury of his wrath, and it's going to be poured out in hatred. There were these Nicolaitans. You know what they were? The best that we can determine? Uh, they believe that, oh yeah, you accept Jesus, but just live any way you want. Live any way you want. In sexual immorality, and lust, and greed, and avarice, you name it. You just do whatever you want, man. You've accepted Jesus. You're covered. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To whom? Are we a church? He includes that, you and me. He wants us to hear this. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Does anybody remember where the tree of life was in the Old Testament? 
Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. So garden, paradise was lost in the fall. Paradise is restored at the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom. And there's going to be a tree of life. And you get to go eat of the tree of life and live forever. Is this amazing? Well, you know what it's connected to? Not what you do, but who you love. Who you love. These are all powerful letters. And, and if I do this, we will not get through this book. Okay? Next one. To the angel of Smyrna. Same thing. Picks out a character of Christ. He's the first and the last. Compliment. I know your afflictions and poverty, and you are rich. You cannot give up anything for Jesus that he won't reward you. You are rich. What, what is it? Jesus said, what if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What good is that? But if you lose your life for his sake, but you gain eternal life, that's where it's at. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Christians will suffer. The devil's going to put some of you in prison to t test you. Persecution. He said, be faithful. That's his counsel. Notice there's no criticism here. He doesn't criticize this church. He who has ear to hear, let him hear what the church Spirit says to the churches. Because he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. They might take your life now, but you'll never be overtaken by the second death. Never, never, never. Wow. Second church. Third church. Pergamos. The angel of the church of Pergamum, he says, right, these are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Remember that in the first, picture, first chapter? He's connecting it back. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. You remain true to my name. Wow. Some of you think the pol political world today is really bad. Anybody here think that? I mean, I do. I think we were terrible times. They were too. Satan has his throne. Satan's on the throne where they're living. Holy smokes, that's terrible. But you remain true. No matter how bad it gets, I can be true to Jesus. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful servant, my witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Obviously, this man who is uh, Satan-possessed kills one of the saints of the church, and uh, he says, listen, you're living in tough times. That's the compliment. You remain true. The criticism, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. In the book of Numbers, Balaam, who is a prophet of God, sells out to Balak. He's going to curse the nation Israel. Every time he goes to curse the nation Israel, the spirit takes over and he blesses them instead. I just can't curse them, and I can't get the money from Balak for cursing them. And he tries this over and over, he can't do it. God won't let him do. Won't let him do that. Balak enticed Israelites. We find that later. I think it's in the book of the Numbers uh, to to eat food sacrificed to idols by committing sexual liberalities. So there's a connection between Balaam and uh, sexual immoralities, and, and uh, they're tolerating. They're tolerating false teaching. Let's say I know I. I People have complained once or twice about the fact that I bring up that gay marriages are wrong. I can't tolerate that. I've got to speak the truth. This whole transgender thing, wrong. I can't tolerate that. I've got to speak the truth. Does that mean somebody might leave and not like me? Oh, well. I'd rather be true to God. He says, likewise, you also hold those who are teaching the Nicolaitan. They, <clears throat> they're all about compromising on your doctrines. He says, repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. There's that expression again. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The overcomer I will give the hidden manna, and also give him a white, a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. So, uh, that's the church. <clears throat> I got a hate set. Alright, or we'll just have to any questions so far about the churches? Right, we're going to go through a couple more. I got a question. Going yeah. back to the one before uh, about Jesus hated. Uh, yeah, I, I read it that he hated the practices of the Nicolaitans, not the Nicolaitans themselves. That is true. He hates okay. their practices. Okay. But but when you go back to the Old Testament, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. 
Okay, and, and so we still have have that issue there, that uh, he will, he he does hate those who do wicked deeds, if they do not repent of them. That, that's that, that's what's going on. A any other questions? You mentioned something about the second death. I think it was the second death. Yeah. The second death is an eternal death. It's the lake of fire. Being cast into the lake of fire, it's going to say later in the book, which is the second death. So I die physically, and if I don't know Christ as my Savior, I'm thrown in the lake of fire, which is called the second death or hell, and it goes by several names. Okay, other questions? These are good. Yes? Now, I don't know if you're going to touch on this later, but so people who are not raptured, Right. During that time, so let's say people who now say they know, Christ, you know, they know of Jesus, or you know, however their attitude has maybe changed over the time. But let's say they never like took him as their Lord, his, their Lord and Savior. Okay. Rapture comes, we're gone. They're left here, and then they're. I thought I read somewhere where they will be blanketed with the with being blind to the fact that we are raptured, there is Jesus, like there's no second chance, I guess. What yeah, I, I, to. Is there a second chance? Or? I believe that there is. That when we get to uh, Revelation chapter uh, 7, I think we'll be able to show that there's okay. hosts of people, yeah. multitudes of people, who accept Christ after uh, the church is gone. Yeah. So there is a chance before the second death then? Yes, absolutely. As long as they're alive, but if they die, there's no second chance. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as you're alive and breathing, you can repent. Yeah. Um, Church of Pergamos. Yes. Uh, they say that uh, the challenge. Uh, I will give some uh, the hidden manna. Hidden manna. I, I, I think, well, I, let me venture uh, what that might be. Is, is fruit of the Spirit when you're... Uh, um, praying or in the spirit. Um, what is the hidden manna? Is that the question? No, it's actually the second one. Uh, I will also give him a white stone. White stone with a new name written on it. Yeah. What is? What is the white? One? Tell me if I'm interested in the manna and the white stone. <laughs> yeah. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. <laughs> so uh, anybody who comments on that, I think, is just giving you a guesswork. I do, I just think they're giving you guesswork, because it doesn't tell us what it is, but it is a reward of some sort. Uh, you're going to have a stone with a name on it, uh, a new name on it, you know what it is, and you've got that, kind of like uh, any of you ever carry around something like, I had on my keychain a little tiny cross, but it kept ripping the hole in my pocket, losing all my change, but uh, you don't just carry that little token around on my key keychain. Uh, you're going to have one given by Christ, is something I'm thinking there. Manna was uh, the food, it was angel food. Not angel food cake, but angel food, um, you know, that's described in the Old Testament. And there was a pot of manna placed in the Ark of the Covenant, all right? And so, uh, but that angel food, it was there to be a testimony of how God provided for them. And so the answer is probably found in those names, what they mean. The, what, the, the white stone, the whiteness, purity, and, the, and a name that he's going to sanctify your name. The pot of manna uh, is food. I, I just don't have an answer for that. I, I'd be guessing. And, and I try to stay away from guesswork as much as I can. So, any other questions? These are good. Got a couple more churches. Thyatira. Uh, <clears throat> this one, towards the end, he flips the order. That's why I put them in red. They, they're out of order for everything up to this point. Thyatira, he likens him up to Jesus, whose feet were like the bronze, his eyes were like fire. Uh, he compliments them on their love, their faith, their service, perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. <laughs> Previously, he told them, go back and do what you did at first, and now he's saying, hey, this way, you know, I really like the way you're doing this. You're doing more than you ever done before. This is great. Uh, nevertheless, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Anybody know who Jezebel was in the Old Testament? Yeah. She was the wife of Ahab, King Ahab. He was a wicked king, and she was a wicked queen. She brought in a Asherah worship, or Ashtaroth, or Anat. goes by different names, depending on which language you're reading it in. Uh, she introduced uh, murdering babies as sacrifice to idols. 
very much like abortion today, killing off the children. God hated it. I think God hates abortion today too. Okay. Don't want to get sidetracked on that too much. She calls herself a prophetess. This woman, Jezebel, of the church, her teachings mislead her servants and the sexual immorality, eating food, sacrificed idols. Uh, his criticism is you're tolerating this stuff. That's why we can't tolerate yes. it in the church either. Uh, I say the rest to you in Thyatira, you, you who do not hold their teaching, her teaching, and have not learned the Satan so-called deep secret. She's connected somehow with Satan. And just uh, it's infiltrated the church there. We always have to be careful that the world and Satan is not infiltrating our church. Only hold on to what you have till I come. To him who overcomes, uh, does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. Oh, you're going to have a ruling capacity in the kingdom. Is that great? What do you want to be, a governor? I don't know what you want to be. Uh, he will rule them with an iron scepter. will dash them in pieces like pottery. I have received authority from my father. will also give him the morning star. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what he says to the churches. Any questions on this? I'm racing, I know. Oh, I want Back enough, I wanted to ask where, I'm not very good with geography, but where's Pergamos? Uh, did I not include the map? Yeah, it's in yeah. Asia Minor. It's in Asia Minor, which oh, is uh, in Turkey today. It's now Turkey. Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just was wondering where Satan lives, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, a guy I was doing visitation, I'd say he lived at his house, and then he named his wife. All right. <laughs> All right, let's move along. Sardis is next. Chapter 3. We, we, we're into another chapter. Angela Sardis, the one who holds the seven spirits of God uh, and uh, the seven stars. I know your deeds uh, and your reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You're a hypocrite. You're fake. So he says, wake up. You're, you're dead. Scripture often called death sleep. So he says, wake up, come on. Strengthen what remains. Remember therefore what you have received and heard and repent. He's got counsel here for him. These are all out of order compared to the rest. So uh, of the, the pattern that's set. It's kind of like when you see something out of order like that, it's like I really want to get your attention here. Look how bad it is in the church. Yet, yet you have a few people at Sardis who have not soiled their clo clothes they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. You know, Noah preached 120 years and only had seven converts, his family. And he was a righteous man. The Bible says he walked with God. We can do this. It doesn't matter how bad our culture gets. We can always walk with God. He overcomes. Will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before the Father and his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what he says to the Spirit. Any questions here? All right. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. To Philadelphia, the one who holds the keys of David. Remember chapter 1, he had the keys. Jesus did. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them to come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Obviously, the synagogue of Satan is the Jewish community that has been persecuting the church. You know the early church was not persecuted by the Romans. That came later. It was the Jews who persecuted the church. And so he calls them a synagogue of Satan. He says, since you have kept my commandment, command and endure patiently I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth I believe that is the hour of trial is the tribulation period and he's saying to the church the church the genuine church is not going to go through the tribulation period because he says those who have ear to hear let them hear what the spirit says to the churches we are not going to go through the tribulation period. I believe that's what that's teaching. He says, wake up, remember. Here's his counsel. Hold on to what you have. The challenge, he who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will he leave it. I will write my name on the, uh, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, uh, which is coming down from God out of heaven. And he who has ear to hear, let him hear what he says to the churches. Wow, is this good stuff? 
I'm going to go to the last of the seventh of the churches. They're all following the same pattern. To the angel of Laodicea, the, the, the pastor, whoever, the words of the Amen. <laughs> Jesus is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot or neither cold nor hot. What do you think he means there? I'm just going through the motions. Hmm? I'm just going through the motions. Going through the motions. They're neither hot nor cold. What, what, what do you mean? Lukewarm. Lukewarm. That's what he says. You're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I am about to spit you out of your house. I say, you say, I'm rich and I have acquired wealth and I do not need anything. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They're fakes. They're frauds. They're fakes or frauds. There's no compliment. <laughs> Nothing to compliment them on. Here's my counsel. Buy from me gold. Become rich. White clothes. Where to wear. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest, repent. He's giving them this counsel. And here's the saddest verse of all these churches. Here I am, Jesus said. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The picture here is Jesus is outside the church. This church is like dead. He's knocking on the door, saying, is there anybody in there alive who will open the door and let me in so I can fellowship? You see, eating and sharing at the table is, is a sign of covenant fellowship. He's saying, please invite me back into the church. This is a dead church. Dead church. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears to hear, listen to what he has to say to the churches. Wow. Now, we've gone through all these seven churches. Yeah, go ahead. There doesn't seem to be much difference between Sardis and Laodicea. No, they're both... Uh, they're, they're <laughs> the churches, you just have to read in detail there to find the, the little nuances of difference. Some of them are glaring and some aren't. Yeah. So what are you seeing that... Any difference there? None? Well, it was Very. a compliment for Sardis. One has a compliment and one does not? Yeah, but it says uh, you have a few people yeah. Yeah. who have not soiled their clothes, but it doesn't sound like they have too much going on there. No, it doesn't. So these seven churches have been characterized. I don't remember who I took these from. Ephesus is the loveless church. They need to get their love back. Smyrna languishing because they've been persecuted. A lackadaisical church during the, uh, they're just lax about everything. The licentious church, uh, they're, they're involved in s sinful sexual immorality. Sardis is a liberal church, and they're generous. Uh, Philadelphia is the lovely church, it's missionary minded, and the lukewarm church. And somebody has come along and said, these are actually prophetic of the ages. The church started out as an apostolic church, but as soon as the apostles were gone, they started to lose their love. Then they went into a period of persecution by the Roman Empire. Then they turned into the state church uh, when, uh, when the Roman uh, Emperor Constantine uh, became a Christian. Well, I don't know if he really did or not, but he saw the sign in the sky and made his army become Christian. How do you make somebody become a Christian? They got a volunteer to do that. And then we move into the papal period. From there we move into the Reformation period, and from there we move into the missionary-minded church, spreading, getting the gospel out, and then in 1948 was the development of the World Council of Churches, the ecumenical movement, focusing not on doctrine but practice. Let's forget what we believe. Let's all just get together in harmony and do things that are, are good. Okay. And so, <clears throat> some have seen that. I'm not sure because the text doesn't tell me it's a prophetic of ages, but I do know when it says it is written to all the churches, plural, there just may very well be an application here as a prophetic element, okay? But <clears throat> you, I, 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 I wouldn't die for that. That would be, you're, you're entitled to your opinion too. <clears throat> so we had the prologue, the first vision, we're going to enter to the second vision.
I've only got 15 minutes for some of the good work things, but I will stop in the middle, but we will stop at 6 because there's another program going on here. <coughs> so, get to chapter 4. No, <coughs> the word church has been used multiple times through this passage, right? We've been to the church, the church, the church. <coughs> Starting chapter 4, you won't see the word church again in the book of the Revelation. That's worth noting. The church is gone. It is absent through the rest of the book of the Revelation. After what verse? Hmm? After, what verse? Chap after the third chapter. Starting verse 1, you'll never see, of chapter 4, you'll never see the word church again in the book. And there's a reason for that because we are into a new vision. The time of the vision, he says, after this. After what? After the things he's just spoken of. Remember the key verse in chapter 1? The things that were the present, and the future, the things hereafter. That after this is looking after the church age is gone. It's over. I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and a voice that had first spoken, I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, okay, the location is in heaven. In this vision, he's no longer on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. He may have been on the Lord's Day, but he's not on the Isle of Patmos. He is transported to heaven, okay, in a vision, and I heard the voice saying, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this, what after the, the last vision of the church. So the content of the vision is that he is going to take place in heaven, and then it says, <clears throat> come up here. I believe this actually pictures the rapture by vision, that John, who is part of the church, is being summoned unto heaven before any judgment begins on the earth. At once, I was in spirit, caught up into the heaven. Does that make sense? Any questions? The time? The location? The content? That's it, I got it. All right, and then what it pictures, I think it pictures the rapture. It doesn't teach the rapture. It's kind of like a picture of it. I, the teaching of the rapture is in the other epistles, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, uh, and other places. Uh, John chapter 14, it's in other places. He says, uh, here, but come up. It pictures, and, and uh, I don't know, you know, this is my cartoon version. I, I, I don't know if it'll be a more direct flight than that. <laughs> okay, yeah. and anyway. As soon as he's caught up into heaven, he says, there before me was a throne. I don't know what the throne looks like, but I do know this is the throne room. In my Father's house are many rooms. Some translation, King James has mansions, but it's literally abiding places, rooms. So in heaven, I believe, this is my opinion, this room is like the war room in the, in the White House. It's the war room. There's a throne in the war room because God is on his throne. That's what we're going to see. There before me was a throne. It's God's throne in heaven. And he said, someone's sitting on it. And the one that sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carneal. Carnelian. What is that? Anybody know what that is? It's a redstone. So i got to kind of get them, you know, uh, the Jasper kind of see-through, transparent, and then the carnival. Never mind. And there was a rainbow resembling an emerald encircling the throne. Now listen, this is my cartoon version. It's got to look far more majestic than I could ever, ever draw. Okay? And so, but I want you to get an idea of the presence of God in the war room, that's what I call it, of heaven. And so God is on his throne. I don't know what God looks like, but that's my kind of picture of it. It's surrounded, this throne in verse 4, surrounded by 24 elders. According, uh, surrounding the throne, there were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. White is always an expression of righteousness. They are redeemed. They're righteous. They've been given the reward of a righteous, a white, white robe. They have crowns. The Bible talks about our crowns. There's, a, there's all kinds of crowns, five of them in the New Testament, given to uh, believers. 
uh, as rewards. But we got 24 elders sitting around the throne. The question is, who are the elders? Any ideas? Resurrected believers? Representative <laughs> believers. And who represents believers? The pastors. Pastors? Who else? The church. The church? Apostles. The apostles, okay. And, and so, I'm not exactly sure who they are, but most theologians believe they're not angels, okay, because the angels aren't given as a reward crowns. Uh, and there's, there, you can read the debates about who they are. Why 24? Why not just 12? That's a good question. Twice hmm? as good. Double? What else? <laughs> Twice as good. Twice, two is, if one is good, two is better. <laughs> could, could be. I don't know. I don't see any women in there. Huh? I don't see any women in there. I'm just looking. Well, elder could be. It, it could be. Because I don't know who they are. They're, I made them all clones. <laughs> 12, does it have a significance? You know, two like seven is completion. So 12, is there significance in 12? There are 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel. Is there a connection there? Ah. Is there a redeemed of Israel? Yeah. I mean, weren't all the disciples Jews? Yeah, but Paul comes along and he talks about the Gentiles being part of the body of Christ. Could it be that there's 12 representing Israel and 12 representing the Gentiles who are a part of the church? Most believe that these 24 elders represent the church. I don't know how they link, whether they're Jew, whether they're Gentile, whether they're men, or whether they're women, whether they're uh, Middle Eastern, European, I could have made them all different colors. I don't know. I just don't know. Okay. But I do know that there's 24 of them sitting around the throne of God in what I call the war room. Okay. There's a reason why I do that. All right. So we got the 24 elders sitting around the throne. Here's an expression. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumble, and peals of thunder. This is the most overlooked, reoccurring expression in the book of Revelation from all my reading of commentaries, and I think it's highly significant. So I'm going out on a limb here because all not everybody else sees how highly significant this is. In fact, I, I got a little right up into your notes there about that. And uh, let me just turn to the bottom of 11. Yeah, I got it on uh, page 11 there. The importance of this expression is overlooked by most expositors. But it is a literary device that John uses to introduce and close the judgments that take place on earth in the tribulation period, that's the seven year period after the church is raptured, as recorded in chapters 4 through 16. I believe you're going to see every time a judgment is completed, it's going to talk about lightning, the rumbling, and the thunder. It's going to, those expressions are going to appear because I believe, like on Mount Sinai, when God came down on Mount Sinai, it shook. It rumbled. There was thunder. There was lightning. God gave the law. This is the law by which you will be judged. Both Jews and Gentiles, if I read Romans chapter 3, verse 19, it tells me that everyone is going to be judged by the law. And so that picture of God in all of his fury, okay, majesty, presence, Makes me think this is like the judgment war room from which he is going to execute judgment upon the earth for the rejection of Jesus Christ and because the people on earth will not repent. And we'll see that as the chapters unfold. So this is kind of why I'm saying I think this is a war room. There's other throne rooms, I believe, in heaven, other places, but this is that particular room. That's my opinion. Probably not going to read that anywhere else, okay? Now, there's seven lamps. Before the throne, there are seven lamps were blazing. So we got the seven lamp stands there. These are the seven spirits of God. That goes all the way back to the first chapter, which said the seven spirit of God were before him. So we, we know who the, the lamp stands to represent. Don't forget, this is a vision. We're not actually seeing the real thing. This is a vision to give us an idea of what God, what it's like in heaven, at least in the judgment room. And there's a sea of glass. 
And so I try to put the sea of glass out there. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal in the center. How many are familiar with the tabernacle in the Old Testament? The temple of the Old Testament, they're pretty much the same. In the innermost sanctuary of the temple, there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was a box. It's also called the throne of God. Isn't that interesting? Here's the throne. There was a veil between that and the, the most holy place and the, the holy place. I think the lampstands here kind of make the veil between the two. Just outside that veil, there was uh, the table of showbread, there, there was the altar of incense, and, and there was also the, the lamp, okay? The, um, the candlestick lamp of the, the seven. Look where this is at. It's, it's kind of like the, the veil, but it's in the next chamber. When you go outside that chamber, okay, you move from the throne of God, which is the Ark of the Covenant, through the veil, the lampstands, there was the laver. The laver was uh, a bowl that the priests, when they did their sacrifices, they would ceremonially wash, okay, because they're getting bloody killing animals. And they ceremonially wash so they could present the offerings. And so there's this, this reminds me of the sea of glass, the laver, okay. Now, as you go out, the next thing that you would have seen was the altar where they burnt the sacrifices on. But Jesus, the lamb slain forever, we don't need him. We don't need an altar there. But we're told that the tabernacle, and then later the temple, was made after the pattern of the heavenly. And here we got a little bit of a pattern, I think, going on. You see that? And so the labor is represented there by the sea of glass. Let's go a little bit further into text. Around the throne there were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in the front and on the back. And they're all covered. And, and the one was the face of a man. He would be on the back side. That's why I illustrated him here. One's the face of an eagle. One is a lion and one is an ox. And uh, <clears throat> these particular these particular thing of them, I call them, because they're not cherubim, they're not seraphim, they're living things. They never stop okay. saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Wow. In heaven, there's constant either chanting or singing in the background, at least, uh, in the judgment room. And the 24 elders fell down before him that's on the throne, and they worshipped him, and they laid their crowns before the throne and said, you are worthy. We live our lives for the Lord and he's going to reward us with crowns. What are we going to do with those crowns? Lay them down. We lay them down and say, thank you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. I pity the person who had no crown to lay down. Wow. That should make me want to strive to live for the Lord all the more. <clears throat> we <clears throat> look into the next chapter. I got that clock's fast, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, I still got six minutes. <laughs> yeah, our, our kids don't uh, get near. Okay. okay. <laughs> In the right hand of him who sat on the throne was a scroll sealed with seven seals. I don't have the seals on there, so just pretend the seals are on the back side and you can't see them. Right. But God has a scroll in his hand. And there's an announcement. I don't know if they have a PA system or what, but there's an announcement. Who is worthy to break in the, the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. <laughs> the scroll, I believe has the judgments of God in it. Nobody can open the judgments of God except for God. All right? And so he got this scroll, and he says, See, the line of the tribe of Judah, he is able to open the scroll. Who says that? One of the 24 elders says that. There is a lion in heaven. So as soon as he said that, John was probably looking at him, 
And he says, see the lion of the, the tribe of Judah. He's able to open the scroll. So he turns to look at, at, at the, the lion. He said, and, but then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Now, I didn't bloody this lamb up. I just thought, that's okay. <laughs> but he looks as if he was slain. Now, this is all vision. Can somebody tell me who the lamb is? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, how do we know that? John 129, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why has he got this slain, look like he's slain? He's already in the vision. He's already sacrificed for our sins. And so he sees, he turns to look at the lion, because he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Jesus says. And instead he sees the lamb looking as if it had been slain. He's saying redemption has already taken place, and he's standing in the center of the throne. He came and he took the scroll. As soon as he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the four and twenty-four elders fell down. They all fell down. Why? This is Jesus, the Lord God Almighty. And they sang a new song. I love this new song thing. We're gonna to come to this in a minute. If you don't like learning new songs, shame on you, because in heaven you're gonna be learning a whole lot of new songs. <laughs> I can see it now. I can see it now. Somebody in heaven's gonna be complaining. How come we don't sing that song we used to sing three millennium ago, you know? Uh, I think it's called Amazing Grace. It's a new song. They sang a new song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. I don't know how many different ways you can sing that, but obviously it's a new song. It's a new song. <clears throat> so we turn at this point to the worship of the Lamb. Chapter 5, verses 7 through 14 is all about the worship of the Lamb. They worshipped with music. He came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before him, uh, the Lamb. And each one had a harp. I can't sing very well, but I don't know. Maybe those couple years of taking the accordion will work on a... I didn't, I didn't do very well on the accordion. Maybe it'll, it'll improve with the harp. There's going to be music in heaven. Could be music. That's why we have music here at church. Listen. Worship in heaven with incense. And they were holding a golden bowl full of incense. And watch what it says. Which are the prayers of the saints. How many of you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Anybody here prayed the Lord's Prayer? Okay, good. Good, good, good. good. You ever prayed that line? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've been praying that for centuries. One day that's going to be answered. It's the prayers. Our prayers are like incense. God loves the smell, the aroma when you pray. Worship in heaven with incense. Worship in heaven with songs. And they sang a new song. There it is. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open it. And it's, This is the new song. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men uh, for God from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. They're, we're going to sing about God's re Jesus' redemptive mission and his accomplishments. It's going to be a new song. Boy, I, I, can't, I can't wait for that because I don't think I'm a very good singer now, but I'm going to be a good singer then. He's praising God. You made them, all these people to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Listen to me. Where did we see kingdom and priests before? First couple verses of the Revelation. We are a kingdom of priests unto our God. They're singing, the 24 elders, everybody there, they're all singing that Jesus saved us, the church. It's in heaven. It's before any judgments are given. We're the redeemed of the Lord. I don't think we're going to go through the tribulation at all. I'm going to be in heaven. I, I don't know how big this war room is, this judgment room. But in a moment, we're going to be told there's multitudes of people there. I think I'm going to be there. I'm, I'm, going, to be, I'm going to be singing when this has happened. You know what? Practice it now. <laughs> every Sunday morning, every now and then, I need my microphone on. You guys tell me. <coughs> oh, I heard you in there. Yeah. I'm practicing. Worship in heaven is going to be with multitude. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels. Many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands, times tens of thousands. Getting the picture? 
they encircle the throne, the living creatures and the elders. Man, there's going to be a heavenly choir. I'm going to be on my harp. And Amy's going to be singing. It's going to be awesome. Come on in, grab a seat. We're not quite done yet. You're good. You're good. I'm almost done. In a loud voice, it's going to be loud. I've been listening. I, we, we visited another church on, on our vacation, and their music was much louder than ours. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. In a loud voice they sang. They were singing louder because they cranked up the music louder too. So in order to hear yourself, you got to sing loud. Years ago, we were at the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Oh my goodness. There's probably, what, two, three hundred in the choir? They had a praise band. They had an orchestra pit. And when we first walked in, it was louder than any rock concert I've ever been to in my life. The whole congregation were standing, and they were all singing at the top of their lungs. You know what? They're getting ready for heaven. Because they're going to sing loud in heaven. If you don't like loud music, you're probably not going to like heaven. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, strength and honor and glory and praise. Wow, it's good. <coughs> they sang in unison, I heard every creature in heaven and earth, under the earth, and on the sea, all that is in them singing. Everybody sings. I have to sit in the front because that way I don't see all of you keep your mouth shut when we're singing. That's a disappointment. I hate to be on the stage watching, you know, be leading the singing and look out there and... I know. You're terrible. <laughs> you're, you're just not practicing for heaven. Are you getting a picture here? So they're singing. To him who sits on the throne of the land, be praise, honor, glory, power forever and ever. Is this amazing? They worship in heaven with faith. Faith. The foreign living creature said, Amen. Anybody tell me what the word Amen means? So be it. So be it. It's really in the Hebrew, it's off the Hebrew word to believe. I believe. I believe. Let it be. It is so. It's, it's kind of a fluid thing. So why would they have faith anymore? Because they're seeing it. I know. But so we still believe. Like, we're, singing, we're singing the songs of the faith. It's pay dirt instead of believing before seeing. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to still say Amen. You know what else? Jesus is called the Amen. That's one of the names of Jesus. That's one of the names of Jesus. Listen, we're going to do it with humility. We're going to fall down and worship Him. Any questions? Because I did do it. We got through. <laughs> Next week, we're going to dive into the part of the book that you really want. Everybody wants to study Revelation, wants to get to the tribulation part of the Revelation. We're going to, we're going to see the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and we're going to see the judgments of God, we're going to see all those things. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful that we know you. And Lord, we're just practicing here when we sing and worship and humble ourselves before you for when we get to heaven. Lord, bless us as the churches. Lord, may we be mindful that we are the church of Jesus Christ. May we so live that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Bless us in the remaining weeks of this study, Lord, as we begin to delve into how our righteous God will set all the records straight through judgment. Bless these young people who just come in, Lord. May your good hand be upon them in the time that they gather for Area 51. Bless them, we pray, in Jesus' name.